because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coaches, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Today, we are super excited to have two-time Division Three National Coach of the Year and 2011 and 2016 National Champion, Coach John Tower with us. Coach Tower coaches at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. His 808 win percentage ranks first among active Division Three coaches and in top five among all active NCAA men's coaches. Coach Tower, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Chris, thanks a lot. I really appreciate uh, you having me on today. Huge fan of your show and your work, so it's it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Coach, obviously your program's had tremendous success over the years, and a big part of that has been your efficiency on offense. Uh, last year, if I have it correctly, most efficient offense in the country in Division Three per synergy stats and led the country in the fewest turnovers. Can you talk about your offensive success? Yeah, I think we pride ourselves uh, being – balanced on both sides of the ball and and we've had a nice run offensively um i think it, you know any coach will tell you it, it starts with players having talented players um and we certainly spend a lot of time trying to develop that in practice and then run schemes that are effective um i wouldn't say we're a system team we we run a fair amount of two guard offense a la john beeline stuff and a lot of ball screens and we're also pretty heavy in transition and i i think the other components you know in addition to players and how you know they develop themselves and we try to help them along is the the psychology of it and and there really are a couple big buckets in my mind you know one of them is that we want them to play really fast and really free and so you know to score over 80 points a game and have about nine turnovers a game requires sort of a, a an understanding and a vision among the players of this is we're not just going to play fast and reckless and it also requires the coaches for us to sort of let go sometimes. And rather than, you know, micromanaging and calling out a set or multiple sets on every possession, uh, which we do occasionally, but I think it's really, that's where you sort of have the art and the science of offense is there's certain good things that you can do and sound practices. But then I think a big part of it is, is getting players to understand a vision of how are we going to do this collectively? What's their part in it? What's our part in it? And then, them understanding that we will give them a lot of freedom as as long as they take care of the ball, frankly, and play unselfishly. I'm I'm imagining just having known you and known the incredible success you've had at St. Thomas, definitely one of the top Division three programs in the country over your time there. But I'm imagining that you aren't making them run for every turnover in practice. That this isn't happening because you're 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 punishing them for turnovers. Can you talk a little bit about how you're reducing turnovers without doing that? Yeah, that it's funny you say that. I'm on a regular call with with a bunch of really great coaches throughout COVID, um, and not too long ago, one of them, an assistant in the NBA, was asked was telling a story actually about when he played in the NBA, and a new coach came in and I think put like five pieces of tape on the wall and said, as soon as we get to five pieces of tape, five turnovers, essentially, we're running the rest of practice. You know, and that didn't sit well. I don't based on the story that didn't sit great with with the guys in the NBA, and I I, I think. Um, we certainly don't talk a lot about turnovers. I think we talk about taking care of the ball and valuing things in life. You know, there's, um, in, in motivation research, we talk about approach orientations and avoid, avoidance orientations. And, and most of us don't operate very well when avoidance mo- mo- orientations are at the forefront. And so we, we try to frame it positively. We don't say don't turn up the ball over. It's more take care of the ball. It's, you know, we certainly do have a goal of under 10 turnovers a game. Now, against some teams, depending on the pace and their pressure, it may be more. Other games will go into it and frankly say we should have under five turnovers. You know, and so I think I think that's I think you're right. We certainly, you know, I get annoyed by turnovers. The players know this. They that we tell them, look at this is our ball. And if you it's just like, you know, any any recess around the around the world. Uh, if you're reckless with the ball, it gets taken away. And so there's different kinds of turnovers. I think one thing that's helped us, I know you're huge uh, and do great stuff with decision-making and we've tried to break it down for them where 
if 10 turnovers a game, let's say five are from passing and five are from ball handling or charges, well, then we try to raise and recalibrate the way they think about passing. So if you ask players, uh, you know, what percent of your passes do you think you should complete? Most young players will say 70 or 80%. And then when you explain to them that we got, you know, 60 plus possessions in a game and about five passes a possession and 300 passes in a game, if you complete 70% of those, that's 90 turnovers. Which, which obviously a team is never going to get to. But to break it down, for us to have only five passing turnovers a game is somewhere around 295 out of 300, 98.3%. And so that's not a magic number, but it's one of those numbers that gets their attention where we want to complete 98.3% of our passes. And if you're throwing a bunch of 90% passes, we're going to have 30 turnovers a game, and we can't have that. Well, it's remarkable efficiency and uh, taking care of the ball and I guess this also reflects in how you practice. Yeah, I think practice is, a, um, you know, that's a laboratory where, again, the art and science, what, what we try to keep in our minds is uh, lots of people chart lots of stuff, and there are great ways to do that. We chart some things, but frankly, I also want them to feel like practice. They can have some of that growth mindset that Carol Dweck uh, write so eloquently about that. If, if every practice starting on day one, they feel like if I make a mistake, I'm not going to be able to dig out of this. Uh, that's going to lead to a lot of fear. And so I think in practice, we, we really try to combine skills and a lot of competition. Um, but also sort of embrace the, you may make mistakes and then figuring out in practice, for example, what are the passes you can and cannot throw? Um, I remember one year we, we sort of were no jump passes, no one handed passes. And we had two seen two veteran guards who were really good. And so I sort of told them going into the year, look at you've earned it. You, you, you're going to make decisions, um, that over time have shown us, we can really trust you probably doing things others can't. Well, the mistake I made, I didn't tell the rest of the team that. And so that's completely on me. Well, before you knew it, it was contagious and it was the worst preseason we had because within days everyone was throwing jump passes and one-handed passes so I had to be blunt and say look these two guards they've earned that right and they don't turn the ball over and if they start to then it's going to get reined in a little bit but I think that's important in practice too to sort of provide guardrails but also give guys the chance to to grow into new roles and, and demonstrate the skills they've worked on. Well, I love this. And so much of what you're talking about is going to lead into our topic today. And we don't want to discount your program success and your incredible job as a coach. But I know we're going to go down some rabbit holes of sports psychology and youth coaching and different things like that, that don't necessarily they relate to your program, but we may approach it more from a youth perspective. So I wanted coaches to connect with how good a coach and how good a program you are. But maybe as a segue into that, can you talk a little bit about how intrinsic motivation and autonomy connect to your audience of philosophy and culture? Yeah, thanks. I, I, I think that's something that when I look back um, and I've, I've had an interesting sort of path through um, grad school in psychology and working with Judy Harakevich at the University of Wisconsin, where we studied factors that affect intrinsic motivation. And, um, you know, there's some great models out there, probably Ed DC and Rich Ryan's model on autonomy, relatedness, and competence um, it has been one of, of those at the forefront over the last several decades. And I think, you know, whenever I look at a player, whether we're recruiting them, one in our own program, I try to sort of take their temperature on those three variables. So autonomy, are they freely choosing to be here? Do they want to be here? So often with young athletes that, you know, I'm sure we'll get into later, they may feel pressure from all sorts of outside sources that they have to do this, that they don't, not necessarily that they want to. Um, Relatedness, are people connected within the organization together and are those relationships real and authentic? And then competence, are you are you doing well? And almost invariably, if somebody's you know showing those signs of burnout or frustration, some one of those, and probably two or three of those, autonomy, relatedness, and competence are probably sort of disordered. And so I think in terms of your question, which is a great one promoting autonomy within an offense can be challenging because everybody has their role and not everybody loves their role at every time in the season or every point in their career. And so I think that's the other part is, is helping them to see that making the right decision over and over again will give them more autonomy. And the more autonomy they get, the more they can demonstrate their skills and, 
and expand their role. But it is it is sort of the symbiotic relationship where you can't just say, hey, you guys all have autonomy, go play. Because if we don't have a structure that sort of dictates our spacing and our movement and what we're going to do when we create an advantage, then it's pretty chaotic. At the same time, I think talking about autonomy and helping guys understand this is how you earn it. And some of earning it is through your skill development, but some of it is just consistently making the right decision that if you're supposed to tight curl, then tight curl over and over and over again, even if you never get the ball. And so I think that's the the two-way street of autonomy. And some of it's giving it to players, but some of it is showing to to coaches. I much like a much like raising kids, um, you know, if a kid shows over and over and over again, I'm following the family rules, they usually get a little more latitude. And the opposite happens if they don't. And I, I think that's what well, at least part of what we try to do to promote freedom and, and responsibility in our offense. Tremendous stuff and uh, uh, just amazing. And coaches, uh, if you haven't had a chance, make sure you add St. Thomas to your watch list, especially if you have access on Synergy, et cetera, and uh, just tremendous team to watch. Now, Coach, let's get into some of these other aspects of sports site that can help coaches. And unique to most basketball coaches is that you have a PhD in social psychology and you conduct research on sports psychology, motivation, competition, cooperation, goal setting. The list goes on and on, including youth sport and different things like that. And your work's appeared in academic journals and coaches, if you don't know some of these journals, they're pretty big time journal of educational psychology, journal of experimental social psychology, journal of personality and social psychology coach, a lot of words, a lot of words to that. And, and uh, this is going to be awesome because of this background. Can you tell us a little bit about that background? Yeah, well, I, um, you know, I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, and so I'm, I'm pretty blessed to get to teach and coach at, at the, in the city I grew up in and at the university I attended. Um, and, and to be honest, to, to try to give you the short version, I, I think I could safely say I was never the most talented guy on any team I was on. Um, but I happened to be on really good teams all throughout, you know, really middle school, grade school or middle school, high school, college. Um, and I think over that time I became fascinated while at the same time I, I loved basketball. I was also fascinated by what made people tick. And my dad was a youth basketball coach. So he was, a, he ran mutual funds uh, during the day, but he coached this eighth grade basketball team for probably 25 years. And so honestly, when I look back at sort of the origin of my love of basketball, I think a lot of it was every night during the winter, if I had my homework done and I had behaved, I got to go off to practice with my dad. And so, you know, when I look at as a five-year-old hanging out with my dad every night, and then as a high school athlete and college athlete, trying to find my way in the world and um, I still remember when I decided to major in psychology, I think my dad and mom were both sort of like, what, what's psychology and what in the world are you going to do with that? Um, to their credit, they, they supported me and said, well, if you, you know, if you want to do something in life really hard and usually things turn out. And so that, that's sort of how it got started. But I was, I was pretty clueless as a sophomore and junior in college on what I wanted to do. And I took the psychology class from a a mentor of mine who's still teaching at St. Thomas. He's been here 45 years, John Burry, um, who was also a basketball coach. You're going to sense a common thread. And I, I just was blessed to have so many coaches and mentors uh, and professors who had an impact on me. And I thought if I could have that kind of impact at some scale on students and athletes, uh, you know, what a wonderful life it would be. And, and so that's sort of how I ended up here. Well, it's, it's great to hear that background and uh, anyone that's listened to the podcast, including yourself, has got hints of how important sports psychology is to me as well. And just so many things. And I think similar, similar things for me attracted to it is that I always felt for me personally, there wasn't a limitation on my mind. Even though there were some limitations on me physically, I thought that things to do with my mind could help me overcome those things. And to what extent, I'm not sure. But I imagine that's the case for a lot of young people that maybe are attracted to psychology. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, I, when you really look at the kind of new frontiers that have happened in, in athletics, um, you know, there, there's only so much variability when you look at NBA players, the top players in the world. There's only so much variability in their vertical jump and their shooting accuracy. And there certainly is variability. But at the, at the top levels, uh, you're going to find pretty tight ranges. And so where are the differences? You know, I think it's between our ears in a lot of ways is who's resilient, who's optimistic, who knows how to build teams, who's, uh, you know, in the off season, who's focused and motivated. And, um, you know, I played high school baseball with five guys who got drafted. 
uh, in the major league draft. I was certainly not one of them. I was never on anybody's radar, but it got me thinking at a young age about what are the ways to maybe minimize some of the shortcomings I had um, in order to compete with guys who had more physical ability. And so that was what really led me to, to pursue intrinsic motivation, which is what I studied in graduate school and uh, was at the University of Wisconsin for five years. Um, and just, to me, it's, it's as important as any topic in the world, because if we can get people passionate and intrinsically motivated about what they're doing, a lot of the other stuff takes care of itself. You know, the old adage, if you find a job you love, you'll never have to work a day in your life. I think I know whether I'm coaching youth basketball, college basketball, raising kids, I try to keep that at the forefront of my mind. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to have fun and be giggling all day long. But I, I do think a big part of our job as coaches and teachers is to create learning and playing environments that are motivating, that are energizing and allow young people to walk out of there feeling better about themselves and more excited to come the next day. Well, we're going to start with that first, which is talking a little bit about youth sport, but obviously it all relates to all levels to a certain extent. But uh, one of your books, Why Less is More for WSP, Well-Intentioned Over-Involved Sports Parents. And, and I just love some of the thoughts that have come out of this. And I think parenting is a topic that we haven't touched on enough probably on this podcast relative to things that truly, truly impact coaches below the college level, and that's dealing with parents. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of what that is, well-intentioned, over-involved sports parents? Yeah, I, th I think that was sort of the culmination of probably, you know, I, I, had done, I had done probably 15 years of research on motivation, and I had started these youth basketball camps my senior year in college back in 1995 with, with my college roommate and teammate, and Mike Bergen. And, and so as I ran more and more of these camps, I just continued to notice parents who seemed like really great people, but were going out of their way to maybe do a little much for their kid. We know from thousands of research studies that neglectful parenting, under-involved parenting is not good. And so it's like most things in life and most virtues and vices, and you got to find that middle ground and balance is so key. But I think in our culture, uh, certainly over the last couple of decades, the pendulum has probably swung to the point where we have all become a little bit or maybe more than a little bit overly involved. And so I started seeing these you know, parents who in the mild versions were um, you know, watching camp all day long and sort of monitoring their kid and the more mild versions where they would do things like tie their shoe or carry their duffel bag into the gym with them in the morning. And I'm thinking, hold on, we got to get through some of these things if this kid's going to grow and develop. And so you know, everything in the middle of that um, from tying one's shoe to micromanaging every activity of a kid's life, it got me thinking um, with all the, the luxuries we have in life, sometimes they allow us too much time and too much ability to you know, be involved or quite frankly, interfere. And so that was sort of the genesis of the book was trying to put down on paper my thoughts of you know, coaching and teaching and research and trying to put them all together and into a relatively simple and useful um, you know, book that hopefully can guide parents. And I start off in a very humble and self-deprecating way saying I was the guy whose kid was on a t-ball team at two and a soccer team at three. And he was coming to my basketball camps at four. So I by no means have all the answers, but I think it's a challenge because we all want our kids to have the best opportunities. Yet sometimes the best thing we can do is just throw them outside and let them play and figure things out the way I hate to sound old, but the way that kids did it in the sixties and seventies and eighties. Football is in full effect, with many teams starting their stuff early. The NBA Finals are here, and the MLB playoffs are in full swing. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Bet BetOnline is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team player and coaching props, BetOnline gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to BetOnline today and take advantage of all the great sign-up bonuses. Bet online, your online sports book experts. Coach, I love this topic and particularly like you're not approaching it. We, we all know abusive parents are bad, so we're not we're not covering that. We're getting into actually the well-intentioned parent and uh, talking about that. What are some of the practical things we can do as a coach to be able to help these well-intentioned parents? Yeah, and I, I think the like coaching, uh, you know, and, and people always ask, does coaching get old? And I always argue, absolutely not. Coaching a ball screen, uh, defensive coverage, that can get old. If you've done it for 20 years, you might, there are times where you think I've done this a lot. Coaching 
young people in my mind never get told because every kid is different. Every young person is different and every parent is different. And I think first and foremost, as, as youth coaches, um, you know, two things, number one, laying out expectations, but number two, making very clear those expectations are centered around providing the best experience possible for somebody's kid. And then as a, as a part of that, the best experience possible for that kid doesn't mean that every day is going to be easy. It doesn't mean that every day is going to be uh, a raging success. It's that we're going to, through this journey of a season, support your son or daughter, uh, try to teach them skills within this sport, but also teach them skills that are going to translate to anything in life. And I think, you know, at its core, that's what we all believe in sports. It's easy sometimes to get sucked up in the wins and the losses. Um, but the reality is that you hope that every youth team, every high school team, every college team at the end of a season, those players feel like I was part of something special. I learned about sacrifice and teamwork and competition. And so I think the, this is a long winded answer about really a simple thing, reminding parents over and over again, this is about your kid's development and development's not easy. I know for me, and I'll try to share those experiences with parents, probably three of the five best lessons, most valuable lessons I had in life were maybe the most painful things, at least at that point in time, right? As a 14 year old, the things that are painful are different than, um, than when you're 48. But I think those are the the reminders that parents need to know that um, Khalil Jaban wrote that the pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses our understanding and getting parents to see that it's difficult to grow without a little pain. And, you know, I always liken it to a safety net that we want kids to skin their knee. We, we don't want them metaphorically to blow their knee out, but they do need to feel a little pain to figure out I've got to get better. Or they end up living in sort of that dreamland where the best sixth grader in, you know, in a state ends up being a very, very pedestrian and average ninth grader because he or she hasn't had to work very hard. And, and what I'm hearing from this is, look, the, the most important thing we can do as a parent, ultimately, beyond l creating a loving and supporting environment, which is similar to what we want to do as a coach, right? Create the safety is we want to create an environment where people, our kids in this example, or our athletes learn how to be resilient. And we can't develop resiliency without them struggling. So we have to get this optimum level of struggle so that they learn how to be resilient. That's a great way of putting it. But I should have had you co-write the book with me, Chris. Um, <laughs> that, that's a great way of putting it. And, and the one thing I would add to that is there are also ways that we can redefine struggle, right? Carol Dweck's work on mindset, and which I think is one of the you know best books this century for coaches and teachers to read. Um, I think that provides a sort of a model as well, where if we reframe things mentally, then it doesn't have to be a struggle. And, and again, this is where you tie it back into intrinsic motivation, that if you're doing something you love and you're working on a really challenging drill, well, you can look at this as I'm struggling, or you can look at it as I'm getting better. I mean, we jokingly have kids at camp when they're doing wall sits, they don't get to grunt and groan and grimace. They, if they're going to make noise, all they can do is say, I'm getting stronger, I'm getting better. So if they want to say that, that's fine. Otherwise, we do sort of these quiet, meditative wall sits. And the idea is getting them to see that just because something's hard doesn't mean that it's bad. You know, and I, I think so often there's disconnects where I'll have a student come into my office or a student athlete, a player of ours, come in and I'll say, hey, how are your classes? And you know, sometimes the young guys will say, well, th this class is going great. It's easy. This class isn't going very well. It's really hard. And I'm like, hold on a second here. Let's disconnect how difficult something is from how interesting it is. Because sometimes the most interesting classes might be the most difficult and the most valuable, the same way the most challenging drills in practice might be the most valuable. And so how do we sort of relabel, reappraise these events so that we, we look at them with at least an interest and appreciation, if not an enjoyment, but players who are committed to getting better. I think the older they get, the more they realize this is the best use of our time are the drills that are challenging and are going to help me get to a higher level. What is your advice to deal with difficult parents? Well, I think difficult parents are really, and there are some, you know, there's the egregious examples. And that was part of what, what led to the book as well. The egregious examples where, you know, you see a parent attacking an umpire on a field and, and it ends up on the news. Those are the ones that I think actually 
through downward social comparison, allow all of us to feel better. The rest of us where we're talking about the more insidious, overly involved parent where um, I think coaches, you know, trying to point out gently the, the example I come back to often is a kid at a baseball or softball game who looks over at mom or dad every time uh, he or she swings or misses. It's though, and those are hard things to break up, right? Cause this is not the person, this is not the parent who's yelling and screaming, but you can just sense there's something there where the child is, is feeling pressure. And so um, I, I always, I think the, the place to start is talking about the kid's experience and things you're noticing about the kid and ways the parent can support. And so, I, because we're not coaching the parent. And so I think it's dangerous to get, unless you really know them well, it's dangerous to get into a, uh, a domain where you're talking about how they're parenting their kid, but more talking about what the kid needs and what you're trying to do to support that kid's growth and asking them for help in it. So one of the studies uh, a long time ago, I remember from the Michigan State, uh, I can't remember the exact title of it, but the Youth Sport Institute there. And the study was basically on outside of, say, solo music performances or giving a speech in front of a class, you sports cause the most stress of anything else in life for a young person. And, th- and this is absolutely what it shouldn't be for a young person, right? Sports should be fun. And as you said, it's not frivolous fun. It's fun in the right context, but it should be fun. I think you're exactly right. And, and there, there is a certain amount of stress that is good to learn how to deal with and cope with. And I think that's something that we need to work with young people because they are going to have stress in their lives, whether it's in their jobs or their families or their relationships. But certainly youth sports ought to be the kind of activity where, uh, you know, one of the distinctions I talk about a lot is, are you playing or are you performing? And sometimes you watch kids and you say, that kid's having a lot of fun. He's playing. And you watch another kid and you think, He's performing. He's performing for his parents or he's performing for something or somebody else. And so I think that's certainly a a component of youth sports. Now, the beauty of sports is it does teach people how to deal with pressure. And, you know, when when kids take a test, there's pressure taking the test because there's evaluation more than taking a quiz, more than sitting in class taking notes. And you add in sort of the public nature of sports. And it's understandable why there is going to be more stress. That's where I think oftentimes we miss an opportunity on how to help young people, first off, develop the self-awareness on who they are, because some people are dispositionally anxious and learning why might you be more nervous in that situation than someone else, and then figuring out and helping them learn coping skills to uh, maximize their performance, even in those most stressful moments, which hopefully down the road in life will serve them very well. I think the old quote that uh, I remember is, it's okay to have butterflies as long as you get them to fly in formation. (laughs) <laughs> right. That coping strategy, this part of it. So can you talk a little bit about coping strategies and some of the things you'd use with, say, your players or with young athletes to help them cope with this stress? Yeah, the, the butterflies analogy is a great one. And, and I think that's the other part is, first off, I think embracing so much of life, right? Unconditional love from others, but also acceptance of, of oneself. And we talk about that a lot in psychology classes. I don't know if we talk about it enough on sports teams that you know, when people are able to accept themselves, and this is true when buying into a role on a team, right? If I understand I'm not a great shooter and my role is to rebound and defend and do all the dirty work, if I embrace that, my teammates and coaches embrace that, that can be a pretty great existence on a team for somebody. And so I think similarly, when you're, when you're talking about dealing with stress, uh, embracing that stress is okay. Like at some level that tells you that you care. And then I think it's, how do I either relabel that stress or how do I use it to my benefit? Because the reality is if you walk out into a final four game, you are going to have some butterflies and you're going to have some adrenaline. And I think the two things we talk about is if you feel too much adrenaline, what are ways to relax, right? We always, as, as young people, I think we think get as pumped up as you can when you're excited for something. Well, we know that being overly pumped up is not a great recipe for success in most endeavors in life that require any amount of skill. If you're running a 50 meter sprint, it's probably a little bit better, but for most things, it's not going to be very good. And so I think, how do we get people to understand sort of, you know, sports psychologists will talk about their zone of optimal arousal. What's your zone of optimal arousal? And that's challenging when you're coaching a team sport, because you might be in a locker room thinking, I've got five guys who need to get more pumped up, five guys who really need to relax, and the other 10 are in a good spot. So that 20-person team, 
how do you try to manage? And I think that's where the assistant coaches and the individual knowledge of each guy, you want to make sure you grab them before the game and you feel like they're in a good spot um, where their stress levels have turned into either sort of positive levels of arousal or just sort of neutral where they're hopefully going to attain some sort of that flow state that, that most uh, peak performances share some components with. Well, I love this because it brings out so much for coaches to kind of research more of and what you just referred to the inner inverted U theory or inverted U hypothesis on arousal control coaches. If you don't know it, it's definitely something you should research because it, it does point to the realities that every individual is an individual, right? And the way you would get pumped up versus me could be completely different. No question. One of the story I always tell with the inverted you uh, in the course on motivation and emotion that I teach one of my closest friends, lifelong friends still uh, in high school, he, he, he took a couple of caffeine pills before a game because somebody had told him that would, that would help him perform better. And so I go on and tell the story that in that game, he had the only dunk of his career. And so I asked the students, well, what do you think he did? Best predictor, of, you know, past behavior, future behaviors, past behavior. What do you think he did? moving forward and they're like well he never had a dunk before that never he took more caffeine pills never he never took another caffeine pill ever and he would he swore them off and so we keep talking why and and ultimately they finally get to the answer he shot one for 14 that game so the, the only basket he made was the only dunk of his life but here was this guy who normally was an incredible outside shooter and he went over 13 on every other shot he took that day so was he pumped up yes did he have more adrenaline than normal? Yes. Did he perform well? No, it was the worst game he ever played, but he did have a dunk in it. And so sometimes you'll see that dichotomy where you're, you're looking at optimal levels of arousal and you got to really ask yourself, what's the outcome you're desiring? That's brilliant. It's great stuff. And as you're saying that some of this stuff, what I, what I was thinking is basically you talked about roles, you talked about talking about this ideal performance state for each individual. And for you sports, this is something that you should involve the parents in that they should understand it for their son or daughter as well, right? Because that would help them understand a little bit more about what's happening with their son and daughter on the floor or on the bench in some cases as well. Absolutely. I mean, at the hallmark of our program at St. Thomas, we, we talk about roles, rules, values, and vision. And I won't go in great detail on any of them right now, but, but I will tell you that everybody's a role player in the game of life. And that's true of coaches, of players, of parents, of sons and daughters. And most parents do understand that at home, right? Most parents have a little chore chart on the wall and the kids have their chores and they don't name an MVP at the end of the day. And they don't give a trophy to the kid that cleaned up the best or just because they cleaned up at all. And so getting them to see what we're trying to do in coaching is actually going to help a lot at home. If they understand that we're all role players, we don't need, uh, in fact, when you, when you look at people who sort of ascend through turmoil in life, usually they had to go through a lot. Um, they also usually didn't have many of the conveniences we have today. In the book, I, I have a chapter on Joe Maurer, and Joe was grew up in St. Paul. He and I went to the same high school, Creighton Durham Hall. Uh, he's much younger than I am, but I've known his family for years. And I interviewed his parents and one of his brothers for the book. Uh, you know, Joe won three batting titles. He was an MVP, one of the best hitting catchers in, in the history of baseball. And if you listen to how he was raised, I interviewed his parents for probably two and a half hours. And I remember at the end of the interview, Teresa and Jake Maurer, I walked out and I thought to myself, gosh, that was kind of boring. And I mean that in a complimentary way to them. It was other parents were not going to listen to that and say, ooh, ah, there's the magic bullet because Jake and Teresa simply just raised three boys and they told them, go down to the park and get your butt kicked. And Joe was the baby of the three. So he was tagging along with his brothers all the time where it just, he figured it out. He never had a trainer. He never had special coaches. He played three sports all through high school. Even when everybody was telling him you should focus on baseball because he was the top baseball player in the country, or you should focus on football because he was the top football quarterback in the country. And he still to this day says his high school senior year of basketball was probably the most fun he's ever had because it was just playing for the joy of it. And so when you look at studies like that, I think what, what Mr. and Mrs. Maurer did was incredibly simple. It was sort of this blue collar approach of we're going to provide love, we're going to provide discipline. But Joe's two other brothers, Jake and Billy, I think are really the evidence that they didn't go on to be all-stars in the major leagues, yet 
the family and the brothers are incredibly close. And so I think when we're thinking as parents, we can't try to raise the next Joe Maurer or the next LeBron James. We're trying to raise a really good citizen who's going to make informed decisions in life. So I, this is this is my my jam. I love all this stuff, and it strikes me uh, two things. Uh, one is there was an old story about Jim Bunting, former baseball player, that uh, used to do some prison outreach, and he went to prison and he would talk to prisoners and he would say, you know, what did your parents used to tell you? And one of the prisoners would say, well, that I'm going to be no good and I'm going to end up in jail someday. And he said, well, my dad constantly told me that I was going to be successful, that I was going to be a major leaguer. I was going to be all that. And it's just such the self-fulfilling prophecy type of thing that exists. And it's so important what we say around young people, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And I think the the sub-discipline of positive psychology, I think, has been great for that. I think as coaches, I know that's something it's easy in the in the heart of a season to get down on a team. Right. We've seen all the warts. We, we, we know the turnovers, we know the weak spots in our defense, and it's so important to, um, well, empathy is the word I come back to over and over mm-hmm. again, and I'm, I'm not always great at it. You can ask my wife about that, but uh, <laughs> empathy is something that I think allows us to put ourselves in the shoes of our, of our players and think, if, if this were my kid, am I treating this person the right way. Yes, they just got blown by three straight times. And yes, that's unacceptable. But what's the best way to give them hope to get them excited to get a little bit better. And and so I think that that part of it, Chris, when you're talking as coaches, um, the more we can be hopeful and optimistic, the more our players are going to follow. You know, I, I always say social psychology, if it teaches us nothing, aggression tends to be get more aggression, helping behavior tends to be get more helping. And just about anything we do as coaches will be get more of that. And so we've got to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, what do we want? And then model that every day. Another thing I'd like your comment on is if again, people that listen to the podcast know, I generally hate generalizations. And, And the fact that we blame, say this generation for not going to play pickup on their own or not free play you know, again, points to like, look in the mirror. We cause this, yeah. <laughs> we cause this, they don't do it because we organize everything and we control everything. And there's a certain safety factor that didn't exist when you and I were young, where we could just go to the park. But can you talk about the danger of generalizations? Yeah, that, well, yeah, generalizations. And I think dichotomizing the world that we mm-hmm. have these yes or no quick fix solutions, because you're right. It's really a complicated, uh, when you look at for example, why don't kids go to the park today? It's really complicated. There's probably six or seven legitimately legitimate major factors in that. And, and some of it is, um, you know, maybe the accessibility or availability of playgrounds, but it's a, it's a vicious cycle, right? Where if no kids go to the playground pretty soon, the playground director says, well, why are we open from 8 AM until 8 PM? There's never anybody here from 6 PM to 8 PM. And maybe when it is, maybe that's maybe maybe at that point in time they start to limit the hours. Well, they limit the hours, and now the kids don't see the the rec centers open, so they don't go there at all. And then the parents start thinking, well, that looks a little dangerous. There's nobody there. I don't want to let them go there if nobody's around. But where did a lot of this start? A lot of it started with organized sports, and there are a lot of great things about organized sports. This is again where I it's always so difficult to point fingers and say this is the bad thing or this is the reason why. But organized sports have provided a lot of structure and a lot of safety, but it's also allowed parents to get our hands in things far more than we probably should. And so when you, you know, I, I tell a story in the book where I, the, the moment for me at camp was where we had 10 teams and you can picture this, Chris, at a camp, 10 teams, five baskets, and we're playing three on three, but I've only got four coaches. And so I tell the kids, all right, look at we can have the 10 teams spread out at these five baskets and everybody can play for the games, get refereed. One of them call your own fouls and then we'll rotate. So at the end of this, you'll get to play five rounds. Every, nobody has to sit out at all. And they all kind of looked at me with this dumbfounded look. I said, okay, the other option is we can have all the games refereed, but then two of the 10 teams sit out and you only play four games instead of five. What do you want to do? Let them vote. Over 80% of the kids said, we don't want to play if there's not a referee. And keep in mind, this is at camp. This is not saying we don't want to play if we don't have a referee at our championship travel game. This is at camp, a five-minute three-on-three game. And so I asked them, why? What? And 
they knew sometimes we think kids don't participate hands shot up and none of them gave the same answer one kid said we'll argue about foul calls another said we'll argue about out of bounds calls another said we'll argue about the score another said we'll argue about substitutions and they went on and on about all the reasons why they knew they were not going to be able to play without an adult supervising them which was incredible it was heartbreaking for me to, to hear them say it but it was also this aha moment like we've done this to them not the other way around if we just let them go play, they'll argue. But what'd you do when you were a kid, Chris, with your best friend every day? You went to the park, you played, you argued, you walked home together, and you did it again the next day. And there's a lot to be learned from that. Absolutely. Conflict's a part of life. Conflict resolution is a part of life. All these different things. I mean, so many benefits to what you're saying there. And I love that. And and again, I don't want to make this about me or anything like that, but my seven and nine-year-old daughters have never played organized sport. And that shocks people. And again, I get it. I have, there's value because I can coach them myself or do different things like that. And that happens a little bit, but by and large, we've let them have a life where they can be creative, they can be bored and they have to figure it out and that we're not going to manage everything. And to me, what it's brought out for them more than anything is the ability to be creative and the ability to be able to figure things out to do on their own. And I got to think that's, that's something that is lacking in a generation because of how we've over-organized every part of their day. I, I agree with you. And I, I think they'll be the better for it when they're older, right? Because I think every generation, you look 20 years down the road and, and frankly, what will companies probably be craving 20 years from now? And even today, people who are able to negotiate conflict in sort of a, a calm uh, understanding how do we work through this and people who are really creative. And those are two skills that you just talked about that if we don't allow our kids opportunities to learn those through sports, we're, we're doing them a disservice. Um, and it, it's just, you know, I was at, um, a youth baseball game the other day and it was, it was a fun day and it's outside, but it's 30 minutes away from home. So essentially, let me put it this way. We, we left at about 1145 in the morning and two games were played home by about 6 p.m. And when I looked at the sheer number of at-bats and the amount of running that happened during that window, my thought was we should have brought these local kids instead of driving to a suburb 30 minutes away. And again, this is no knock on any individual, but we would have been much better bringing 20 local kids down to the local park and saying, run your hearts out for the next two hours. There aren't, you guys call your own balls and strikes, argue whatever, and have two parents there just making sure the kids aren't fighting or you know, getting into anything serious, and they would have gotten more bats, more repetitions, and practice creating what you just talked about. Maybe it's only seven on seven, so we can't play with a right fielder, and we can't play with a second baseman. We'll figure it out. Maybe you can't hit to the opposite field. Figure it out. But uh, what you just said, Chris, my hunch, your kids will be no worse for it um, because they'll have chances to be on teams when it's you know when it's ready when they're ready. Well, and again, that strikes me about this this unique time we're in, this pandemic time. A lot of kids have been forced to, again, be home longer, have less organized stuff after school doesn't exist. So yeah, so there, I'm, in a in a weird way, this might really help this generation kind of get some of the some of the things that we got out of our generation that had a lot of these unstructured moments. I agree with you. Biking around the neighborhood and and going to people's houses to see what they're doing and and can we hang out? You know, family monopoly games. Um, during the evening. Th those are things when you talk to, to parents and families, I think a lot of us have, have realized when we get off that treadmill that's going so fast, and, and there are good things about that, but when we get off it and say, hold on, if we slow down a little bit, there's other simple pleasures right in our neighborhood that if, if we're just walking as a family, that can be a great night rather than being at a youth sports event. I mean, you talk to a lot of parents and there are a lot of parents who say, I'm at a youth sporting event for four or five days a week and we have to split up because mom's at this one dad's at this one and you start thinking about okay at what point have we saturated that market where our kids at every one of those events really learning valuable skills or is it just filed away in their brain as just another game and certainly you hear you hear mba coaches talk all the time about aau culture and how it's led kids not to fear losing, right? If you grew up on a playground, you knew if you lost, you were sitting out, you might not get to play again that day, or you were going to wait another hour before you got back in a game. 
if you're in an AU tournament, you know, we're guaranteed six games and there's good things about that where, you know, Hey, we're going to get to play six games, but the sting of losing isn't quite the same when, you know, win or lose, we're playing at 1130. Such a great point. And, and I'm sure you've heard this from parents during this time too, about how so many parents have said it to us, just how much they're enjoying not having four or five things scheduled, say at night, at night, you know, Kumon lessons and violin lessons and baseball practice and this and this. And I'm like, you do this to yourself. <laughs> you know, the kids aren't necessarily asking for it either. And so, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. <laughs> I, I, yeah. And I think the thing we all come back to, and this is where parenting it's, it's, it's like a lot of things in life. As soon as you say, I think I got it figured out. You're in deep trouble. And every day is a different adventure. But the, the thing that I try to ask over and over when we're looking at these different activities is what's the goal here. And if, if the goal is to stress us out, then yes, let's play three activities where, you know, my son's going to feel torn and like he's not doing a good job for any team because he has to miss all of them. But instituting some rules, and this is where I think parenting, there's so much great stuff, Chris, that you and I have talked about that different parenting styles, right? That in the 40s and 50s, the authoritarian model, I mean, there were some downsides to that. We know now, um, you know, balancing love and discipline with more of an authoritative approach is far better. And I think giving kids some choice. One of the things we tried to do with ours was to, to say, growing up, you can sort of outside your regular school seasons, you can pick a sport you'd like to do a little more of in the summer, but you can't do two. So you can't do AAU basketball and be on a soccer team. You just can't. And you can do either one, but and you can change it year over year. But we're not going to stress you out. We're not going to stress us out. And you're going to you're going to try to have some semblance of reality within the schedule. But allowing kids to see why that is. Um, and similarly, how often are kids signed up for activities where they don't necessarily want another league? I mean, we're getting to the point in Minnesota where the weather's starting to get in the 40s and 50s. I'll tell you, there are not a lot of kids that truly want to be outside playing doubleheader baseball games when it's 45 degrees as a 10-year-old. And so, again, thinking about, do we really need to do this or should we go rake leaves? Love it. Love it. And look, we could spend a lot of time on parents. And I think this topic is arguably one of the most important ones for so many coaches. I do want to use some of your expertise to talk a little bit about uh, game coaching, game emotions, and, and doing some different things around that. But one that kind of is a segue between both, and I know you've talked about, is this concept of communication. Too much, not enough, and finding the balance. Because I do remember a youth study suggesting that the number one complaint for parents wasn't playing time. It was a lack of communication. Like when parents are busy and over scheduled and all this other stuff. And when the coach doesn't communicate exactly say practice time changes, when we're leaving for the tournament, tournament schedules, all these different things. So communication appears in a lot of different ways. That was just one example. Can you talk about finding the balance? Yeah. And, and like parenting, that's where I think, you know, I know at the end of every season, when I look at our players at St. Thomas, some of them are probably going to think I communicate too much, some not enough, and some right in the middle. And you're never going to please everyone. Uh, and I think that's probably the, the, the first two best pieces of advice I got from my college coach, Steve Fritz. Number one was you got to be yourself in coaching. And number two is you're not going to please everyone. Like you got to get to a point, And it's easier when that's your profession than when you're a volunteer seventh grade basketball coach. But you do, you do have to be upfront about that. And I think it's good to remind parents that, that look at, if you're a, if you're a youth basketball coach or a high school basketball coach, that's not, you, that's not your full-time job. And I think parents forget that a lot of times that these people are dedicating a lot of hours and they're not perfect, but they're trying. And I, I like to err on the side of giving people credit, the benefit of the doubt, benefit of the doubt. I do think coaches um, need to have some sort of policy with communication as far as what's acceptable, what's not, you know, right after a game, don't approach a parent, you know, a 24 hour rule. A lot of coaches have that, which I think can be uh, really helpful, but, but finding that balance, Chris, I wish I had a better answer for you other than I think like raid kids, it's a, it's a day to day thing. And, and some parents are going to need more communication. I think the, the biggest thing is listening to people. I go back to empathy that if, if you've got a parent who's frustrated, it's, it, it might be the frustration is stemming from something else. It might be they're frustrated because their kid used to be a star and isn't anymore. 
And some of your gift as a coach to them might be helping them see that's okay. Like as a coach, if you show a parent, I'm going to love and support your kid, no matter how well they play. Sometimes that's important for a parent to remember. And I often say that one of the greatest curses a young athlete can have is being a real prodigy at about fourth, fifth, sixth grade level, because most of those kids have developed more quickly and it's going to be tough to keep up with that. And so, you know, I know you asked about communication, but I think that's going to, that's going to be a hallmark of just about any interaction you have with a parent is what are we communicating on and how do I get the parent to see um, and the athlete to see that I've got their best interest in mind while keeping the team in, at the forefront as well. We tell that to our college players all the time. Like we want to love and support them. However, our first job is to make sure that we do what's right for our basketball program. And the program has been around for over a hundred years and this season's incredibly important and each player on the team's important, but you know, that selflessness that we want them to have on the court. We also want them to see that they're a part of something much bigger than themselves. And all of us players and coaches have a, a tremendous responsibility to the, the university and the program and the legacy. In addition to not discussing, say, playing time or some issues with parents after games, would you suggest the same with players? Because part of it is right after games, everything's filled with emotion. Either you won and you're fired up and someone's going to bring you down or vice versa. Someone's going to make you feel worse because <laughs> you already feel bad because you lost. Is that a suggestion for dealing with players at our levels too? Absolutely. You know, so much of Chris, where we, we come back to, and I think appropriate is the power of emotion in sport, right? And, and there's research on the misattribution of arousal that very often we don't know why we're, we don't know exactly why we're really happy or really angry, right? Displaced aggression. I might have a terrible day at work and I come home and I snap at one of my kids. Well, it really had nothing to do with the kid. And I've got to step back and say, hold on a second here. I'm irritated because I had three long meetings. Those didn't go great. Practice was sloppy. Traffic was bad on the way home. And now all of a sudden I snap at my son because he left a candy wrapper on the floor. Well, hold on. He hasn't done anything wrong all day. And I certainly could just respectfully ask him to pick up the candy wrapper. So when you're talking about playing time, I think that's a perfect example where I know there are games after we've had big wins where now I'm really excited, right? And probably the thing that would put me in the worst mood, even worse than after a loss is a player who wants to talk about playing time right after that. Cause you're thinking we just got a huge win and you're focused on, uh, on, on yourself, quite frankly, I think the, the thing that we try to talk with players about is don't talk about playing time. Talk about how you're playing. And we're because because playing time can be arbitrary. You might be, Chris, a great player and we play 25 minutes a game and all of a sudden you play 18 minutes one game and you played really well. And now you're kind of thinking as you go home, what happened, understandably. And later it might be, well, you got two fouls in the first half and your backup hit three straight threes. And then the other team went to a press defense and was being really aggressive and we needed our ball handling lineup in. And so Chris, you didn't do anything wrong. You just played 18 minutes. Like don't read into the minutes. So let's talk about how you played. We think you played great, Chris, even though you only played 18 minutes, if you keep doing what you did last night, you're going to get plenty of opportunities. And so I think that's one of the ways to talk about is let's not talk about playing time. Cause you and I know that in the heat of a game, uh, sometimes you forget to put a player back in. And I think it's important as a coach when we realize that, I know there are times after a game where an assistant might say, Hey, you know, we didn't get him back in a second shift, the second half. Well, then I'm going to usually reach out to that kid. And it might just be a text that night to say, Hey, you played great. Don't read into what happened. Football is in full effect with many teams starting their stuff early. The NBA finals are here and the MLB playoffs are in full swing. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at bet online. BetOnline is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team player and coaching props, BetOnline gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to BetOnline today and take advantage of all the great sign-up bonuses. BetOnline, your online sportsbook experts. Listen up, fellows, because today we have a new Manscaped product alert. Manscaped just released the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Take a look in the mirror and I guarantee you'll see hair sticking out of those holes. It's time to keep your ear and nose hair looking as nice as your clean-shaven pubes. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Weed Whacker. The nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs 
in those delicate holes. The premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered 360-degree rotary dual blade system. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience and it is waterproof, which makes for easy operation and cleaning. Look, fellas, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code armchair at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code armchair. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weed. Thank you, Manscaped, for keeping our pubes trimmed and hairs in our holes looking nice. Now back to the podcast. So uh, the, the other part that uh, always, always struck me about dealing with playing time, particularly with parents, but it started to apply to me with my players too, is that I didn't want to have playing time discussions without having practice discussions. So one of the rules I had for parents was they had to come to practice before we discuss playing time. Because usually the reason why someone's not playing as much shows up in practice more than it shows up in the game, right? And then that seemed to apply to me having some video edits for my players on on practice and practice habits or whatever that may be that help me have a better conversation with players about how to understand their role or how to understand why they're playing less or more depending on the situation. Does that make sense to you? Have you have any other tricks or advice for coaches in terms of those things? Well, yeah, and I think it's a slippery slope, right? Because when you start, two things happen. One is if you start allowing parents at any level to watch practice, and sometimes they do at the youth level, they can start talking to their kids saying, hey, you got to practice hard tonight. And the kid practices harder. And now all of a sudden as a coach, you're in a tough situation where the parent showed up to practice and the kid did practice harder that night. And now you tell the parent, well, that's not usually what happens. And now they don't believe uh, the reality that you're spinning. And so I think, I think it is really challenging. I, I know this as a parent. Um, I think, it, I know I was always scared to tell my parents if I got in trouble in school, mom, dad, if you're listening, sorry, I didn't want them to know. So if I got in trouble, um, I was very unlikely to go home and say, my math teacher was unfair to me. I'm thinking, I hope my math teacher doesn't send a note to mom and dad because they're going to be disappointed. And then I'm in trouble at school and I'm in trouble at home. And I think that's one thing we've probably gotten away from is I think as parents, we've become such advocates for our kids that we almost assume the coach or the teacher is wrong. Um, a couple of years ago, my oldest, who, who was a really good baseball player, and he's now given it up because he just he didn't love it. And he wanted to play basketball and soccer. And that was fine, even though baseball probably naturally was his best sport. And so he came home one day in eighth grade. And I said, how was the game? And he said, it's terrible, it's stupid coaches don't know what they're doing. I batted 14th. And it was one of those teams where everybody got to hit and it was a school team. They weren't great. So he, he was one of the better hitters on the team. Objectively. I said, well, what, instead of calling the coach, he's like, I'm not playing on that team. I said, well, hold on. What did you do? He's like, what do you mean? I went, so what'd you do to the coach? He's like, what do you mean? I said, well, we can agree. You're not the 14th best hitter on the team. So if the coach is batting you 14th, he's doing that for a reason. You pissed him off. You did something. What'd you do? He's like, I didn't do anything. I said, okay, well, go back and ask him what you did. Came back next game, batted 14th. This is stupid. I said, hey, that's it. And I shut it down. I said, we are not having this conversation until you go talk to your coach and you ask him why you're batting 14th respectfully. And you get the answer. Otherwise, just accept batting 14th because you're there for a reason. And I think as parents, we have to remember that, that coaches are not always right. We tell that to our college players all the time. We are going to make mistakes. Our best players miss 50% of their shots. As coaches, I hope I don't miss 50% of the play calls, but we are going to make a lot of mistakes. And being humble as a coach, reminding parents, we're probably coming full circle, Chris, but I think that's the other thing we can do. Reminding parents, we aren't going to be perfect. Sports aren't about being perfect. Sports are trying to build teams that are willing to work for each other and be tough under the toughest conditions to prepare themselves for life. And so I think that's the other part as coaches is we make lots of mistakes, try to own up to them when we do, and also acknowledge the gray area that sometimes who knows if it's a mistake or not. I call a backdoor lob. I don't know if it works. I look like a genius. If it doesn't, I look like a fool. I don't know if that makes it the right, the outcome doesn't necessarily make it the right call or not. And so reminding parents that we aren't going to be right, but we're going to do right based on what we see. Oh, I love that example because I think sometimes on Twitter, I should be posting plays that didn't work, but still were good plays. 
right? <laughs> Absolutely. Like, the, hey, the right. three that rims in and out, that may have been the best play of the day. I yeah. know as coaches, that's what we always judge it on. We pause it when the guy takes the shot and we ask the team, are we yeah. good with this shot, right? And if they're good with it, then it's like, good, we'll, we'll win a lot of games if we keep taking those shots. Evaluate decisions independent of outcome. It's so, yeah, exactly. so hard. And it's very hard. It's much harder for parents, I imagine. Yes. And, and keep in mind, parents want the best for their kids and they've just had a long day at work or at home with their kids. And so their stress levels for other things, they implicitly, the parents probably just want to come to the game, enjoy it and see their kid have fun. And all of a sudden in the heat of the moment, I see my kid strike out twice and he makes an error and now he's playing in right field. And now I'm sitting outside thinking I haven't made dinner yet tonight. What? And pretty soon, like you said, sports have created way more stress in our family's life than if it weren't around. And that's what we all have to be careful of, that, that sports should be adding things. It shouldn't be adding stress. It should be adding good things. Well, I love your counter argument about parents at practice. But I am curious, what is your overall philosophy on that as a youth coach? Because one of the things I came back to in terms of having people attend and watch practice, and our practices were open to anyone, but it was mainly because we have to play in front of people. But saying that, I do think it sometimes created conflict or stress or whatever it may be for my players because they were aware that they were getting corrected in front of people, which doesn't happen as much in a game. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, our practices are open. I think coaches, you know, just about anybody who wants to come to our practices is certainly uh, allowed. I don't know if I'd let a conference, you had Doug Novak on here before. I don't know if I'd like, although Doug and I have joked that we should just go swap teams for a day and coach each other's team. And um, how fun would that be? That's and, and, the ultimate, wouldn't it? That's the ultimate <laughs> test of a coach. I'd love that. It would be, his players would probably be uh, wildly disappointed with the, the trade they got, but um, but I, I think opening practice is a, is a bold move. Um, I think, I, I think if you do that and parents are involved, letting parents know the things that you look for, right? What, because what a parent is looking for and every parent is, if it's a basketball team of 10 kids, every parent is going to gravitate to their kid. So if their kid doesn't get the ball very much and in basketball, by definition, you're getting the ball one tenth of the time if you're on the court the whole time. So you don't get the ball a whole lot. So most parents are not going to know, hey, look at Jimmy's off ball defense was not good there. Jimmy didn't back cut when he was supposed to. Jimmy didn't space when he's supposed to. Jimmy's not running to the corner like he's supposed to. So the, I, I think doing that, it would be really important to say, here are, you know, here are six or seven things that we expect our players to do every possession. And so watch your child when they don't have the ball to see if they're doing those things because parents are even, even parents who are coaches are naturally going to watch their own kid more than watch the game. I know how I watch a video of a game when I'm scouting is very different than if I watch a game where one of my kids is playing. And I have to be honest about that. Again, I can't remember who I got this from, but it was basically, you know, every parent wants their son or daughter to be an all-star before they want the team to win. And that's not necessarily true. Again, that's a generalization, which goes against what I say kind of, but it gave me perspective on saying, okay, remember the parent is approaching it from one perspective or one or two players' perspectives. And I'm approaching it from 12 to 15 players' perspective. And that's a completely different situation. Completely. And as a coach, you truly, if you're doing a good job as coaches, we are walking out of practice every day, thinking first and foremost about our team and then thinking about individuals and how we can help them and how we can help them help the team. But you're exactly right. We, we've done research, survey research on this. And, and when you ask parents, what are your goals for your kids in sports? They will give you really noble goals. And I think they're being honest, but they'll talk about character development and competitiveness and resilience and teamwork and learning how to set goals and work. I mean, they'll, they'll go on and on. There's probably 15 different goals that a variety of parents will list. And when you talk to coaches and you say, what do you hear in terms of complaints from parents? The number one complaint is what, Chris? Well, playing time. Playing time. You got it. Yeah. And I just put you on the spot and you, yeah. could, I, but that is, and everybody knows that. And so you think about the hypocrisy, right? Unintentional hypocrisy, but I want to see the first parent who goes to a coach and says, my kid is not learning moral development, resilience, 
learning how to deal with tough situations. You got to put him through tougher stuff because he's not learning how to deal with it right now. You're playing him too many minutes. I see him jogging back on defense. He should play fewer minutes like that. That's what we should be telling coaches. We should go tell them, I don't think my kid should play as much as he is right now because, frankly, you're reinforcing bad habits. One of the things we talk about, what we allow as coaches, we encourage, whatever we allow. So if I've got the best kid on a team, a 13-year-old team, and I see the coaches playing him every minute, even though he's jogging back on defense, I'm actually doing my kid a bigger service if I go tell the coach, you got to sit him out. Every time you see him jog back, he's developing bad habits and he thinks he's better than the team because he gets to keep playing. And I've never heard a parent, I shouldn't say never, but how often do you hear parents complain that their kid's playing too much because they're actually being allowed to form bad habits? A coaching mentor of me told me a story once of uh, this coach, this coach who I'm talking about threw a player out of practice. The kid started to walk out of practice and his dad was there and his dad, and he said to his dad, he said, Hey, let's go. I got thrown out. And the dad said, I didn't get thrown out of practice. You did. I'm staying. And it was like, just one of these things that was like, just pointed to me. And I've told that story ever since in all my coaching classes and all the different stuff to kind of say, Hey, listen, we should be supporting the coach a lot more in what they're trying to do in terms of, as you said, build this moral character, build this character, build this development beyond just playing a sport. And when you think about teams, you think about families, you think about any organization, right? no matter if you look at it top down, horizontally, vertically, what needs to happen? There has to be buy-in. And we talk a lot with our kind of, you know, locker room, policing the locker room. Like if you're a senior and you hear a freshman who's complaining about playing time in the locker room, it is your job to go tell him or even walk him up to my office and say, hey, talk to this guy, talk to the coach. Mm -hmm. We don't want to hear in the locker room, you're unhappy about your lot in life. You know what you need to do either fix it or go talk to the coach. And I think parents where we do a tremendous disservice is around the dinner table. If a kid comes home and doesn't like his or her lot in life and the parents says, yeah, the coach doesn't know what he's doing. Well, rest assured where the kid is going to choose. Do I, do I side with the coach who's not playing me and says, I'm not very, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. Or do I side with my parents who are saying the coach is an idiot. So now I go back and I tell Other kids on the team, yeah, the coach is an idiot. And pretty soon, all the non-starters are complaining about the coach. Well, that's the kind of thing as parents, our role. That's the insidious nature of it. At the dinner table, if we tell the kid, hey, have you talked to the coach yet? I'm happy to support you, but we're not going to complain about the coach because you're not getting what you want. You're not going to get what you want in life a lot of days. And that's what sports prepares us for. Coach Joe Razzo, you, I, I worked for for a long time. He called those locker room lawyers. And it's like, you're not, you can't be a locker room lawyer for someone else. Again, it's exactly like you said. And I think this is one of the most important takeaways for coaches who listen to this is we've got to constantly reinforce the players. It's like, yeah, you guys can have discussions amongst some of these things, but most of them you got to have with the coach. because <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately and, he's the one that decides. And more and more, Chris, the, the, between high school sports, AAU, trainers, you name it, kids have a lot of people in their ears. Mm -hmm. And we all want to hear somebody tell us we're good. And so if my trainer who I've been working with all off season has seen me make shots and now I'm not playing at all. And my trainer tells me I should be playing more. I'm going to want to hear that more than the coach. And so how, how do we get our players? And I think this is important to talk with them up front that, the outside noise, you have to realize nobody out there really knows what's going on inside the gym and practice. Most of the players do. I mean, we have our players rank each other a number of times throughout the year and not just on who should play or how many minutes, but who's the hardest worker, rank them one to 18. And I'll tell you, instead of me yelling at a kid to run harder, when I call him in and say, listen, unanimously, your teammates said you are working less hard than anyone else. And these are guys who love you. They're, they're your friends but they're objectively telling. So I think providing that in a, in a supportive way, but holding up a mirror saying, this is not just what I'm, I'm not doing this to be difficult with you, but this is what's happening day after day after day. How do we change it? And that is a coach is it's not easy, but I think it really is the art of coaching is trying to get, get people to see a different reality that benefits the team, um, which is, which can be difficult. 
in the Don Showalter podcast, we talked about that ranking, having players rank each other, uh, who should take the last shot, who should play, et cetera. I called them sociograms because that was the term that was used with me. But then when I started to research that, because some coaches asked me for more information, I couldn't find necessarily that term. Is there a term that coaches should be looking up some psychological examples or different things like that of what you're talking about, peer rankings? Uh, well, I, you know, and I think uh, th- when we talk about uh, social comparison, and I don't know if that's where you're going, but it, yeah, we, probably I didn't know the term. So I was kind of asking you what coaches should look at for more information on that. Yeah. And I think that's one way to go. I, I think the two things we tell guys, we make them put their names on it, but we tell them we will not share their vote with anybody else. But I want to be able to call you in and Chris, because Chris, you might, the other thing it does, it gives you a voice where maybe I'm starting somebody and you rank him the 15th best player. Well, I respect you. So I'm going to call you in and say, Hey, you had him ranked 15th. He's starting a point guard. This is just between us, but, to, and you might have information that I don't have or a different perspective that I don't have. And so that's, I, I think that's important. We do have them put their names on it, but we say we're never going to share their vote with any, or their ranking with anybody else. Um, and we also don't force it. We, we say, look at, we aren't going to, you don't need to know what you're ranked. We want to know what you're ranked, but we don't post these. So I, I do think the public versus private, you alluded to this with your practices, there are certain things that whether it's in a locker room, in a practice gym, in a film room, that is sort of sacred within a team that, um, you know, sports are evaluative. And, and these kids are on a stage that can be, um, you know, a pretty big one. And certainly, relatively speaking, if you're a fifth grader and you're playing in front of 50 people, that's a big stage. And so understanding that and us trying to, to again, I come back to empathy put ourselves in a kid's shoes. What am I trying to do to help him or her become a better athlete and a better person? The other part that you brought out as you were talking about this, and I think is an overriding theme of this, like we tend to be focused on, okay, the problem, the problem, but you're also talking about noticing success of players, no matter what their role, whether they're good, they're bad, they're ugly, whatever it is, you're noticing their success. You're finding a way to be able to bring positive to their lives as well. Right. I think that, and again, you learn from coaches. I learned that actually from a high school coach that I didn't play for, but I just, I I watched him. And then, and then my high school baseball coach, Dennis Denning was another one who did a tremendous job of that where you, I think pointing out to the team, for example, um, assist to turnover ratio is not a faultless stat, but it's one that I think is really valuable. Like if you're, if your assist to turnover ratio is really good, Chris, a lot of good stuff's going on. You could have a not great one and still be a great passer because guys are missing shots or you don't have great shooters around you. But that, to me, that's a stat that embodies, you know, we say play hard, play smart, play together, which isn't novel. But I think when you talk about playing hard, you're taking care of the ball, playing smart, you're taking care of the ball, making good passes and um, playing together, you know, making good decisions. Well, if I'm uh, probably to a fault, I highlight after games, the guys who had seven assists and one turnover. You know, we had a kid last year who um, I just saw down in our gym working out, Ryan Lindbergh, he had 53 assists, 10 turnovers. And he led our team in minutes played and he scored about six points a game. So what's amazing about a kid like him, uh, we also have an All-American point guard, Anders Nelson, who scores a lot more points and is a tremendous player. Our guys probably get sick of me talking about Ryan, but quite frankly, Anders is incredibly talented and you aren't going to have 15 of him on your team. When I point to what Ryan did and say, listen, 53 assists and 10 turnovers, and he's a great shooter, yet there are games that go by where he doesn't shoot. And he guards the other team's best player most of the time. And this is a kid who came out of high school as a star scorer. So when I talk about Ryan to the team, I can say, look, he's playing the most minutes on the team. Last year he did for a team that went 26 and three. He played the most minutes. And what did he do? He took care of the ball. He shared the ball. He played tough defense and he knew his role. And so to me, I think that's inspiring for the entire room that there's only going to be one All-American. And most teams aren't going to have any All-Americans. There's only going to be one leading score on a team. And so we need to reinforce all the other stuff that we want as coaches to where I don't know that we ever talk about scoring in our locker room. It just happens. And sometimes they feel bad. Last year, I think Anders had 40 points in one game. And 
I went home and we won in overtime and he just carried us that night. And I went home and I thought to myself, Oh my God, I don't even know if I complimented him after the game in the locker room because I don't even think about scoring. Um, but I think that's one of the ways that we try to draw attention to it with our, with our guys. Just to add to that, I had a chance to embed with the uh, OKC uh, blue, the G league team with uh, when Mark Dagno was the the head coach. And when he did the post film session with just the post players, it was all about screening and who rolled hard and didn't get the ball. And it was like a whole film session almost devoted to noticing things that, you know, from the outside, you might not think is significant, but from the inside, it's like, Hey, this led to the play, even though you didn't get the ball and you didn't get rewarded, we're going to acknowledge it. And then he made sure in the team session, he acknowledged it in front of everyone. That was really That's awesome. Cool. Yeah, it was really yeah. cool. And it brings home exactly what you're saying is that we need to find these things in all situations to acknowledge the little things that make such a difference. Yeah, I think you look at what the Lakers have been doing and, and we're going into game five here. But you look at Dwight Howard's role with them right now compared to what he was doing six, seven, eight years ago. And it's really incredible. It's one of the bigger transformations that I've seen in terms of somebody who, you know, was arguably one of the top three or four players in the world for a period of time. And he's now running to the rim and he's bringing defenders with him, and he's making other centers. I mean, you could tell in the Denver series, his job with Jokic was just to wear him down, be annoying, be physical, do all these things that don't show up in the stats. Yet I really thought watching that series, there was virtually no way Denver could win if Howard did that to Jokic because of how valuable Jokic is. And Howard was just draining, you know, gas from his tank every single possession. I want to end with this because this is something I brought up with you and I, I just think it's so important and I don't think I've talked about it on any podcast. And this is dealing with slumps or emotions of struggling players. Like let's just say a shooting slump because it's the easiest one to be able to visualize as a basketball coach. Can you talk about some strategies for us as coaches to be able to address these slumps? Yeah, I, I think, um, and look, we've all been in them, right? And I think every coach, this is when we when we talk about empathy, every coach probably understands that better than anything because an athlete, you're going to have those stretches. Now, this is a complicated question, and I'm a stats geek, and most, most research would say that the hot hand doesn't really exist. Now, we can debate the minutia of the data on it, but but the hot, there really aren't many streaks in life. Most things are far more random, right? So if you're a 50% shooter, you're going to have some streaks where you make three in a row, some you miss three in a row. But arguably, that's not a hot hand. That's flipping a coin and it comes up heads three times in a row. That doesn't mean the coin is hot. We would never say that. Now, some people lose a lot of money in Las Vegas because of that, right? On the roulette wheel where they say, oh, you got half the people saying there's been six straight reds. We got to have another red. And other people are saying, there's been six straight reds. The next one has to be black. And clearly, both groups are wrong. and Nothing has to happen. And so I think I start from that premise with shooting, is that we're looking at base rates, and we hope we know from practice, number one, mechanically, who are good shooters. Number two, who's a really good shooter at game speed. Number three, who can shoot under game-like situations and pressure. And so if, if we've developed confidence in our shooters in those three aspects, their mechanics, game speed, and under pressure, now I believe, I believe in my heart you're a great shooter. Last year, we had a guy who really good shooter. He started the year, I think he was two for 20-something on threes, and he's a really good shooter. And he sort of stopped shooting, right? And he sort of passed up. We all know ways to do it where you shot fake when you shouldn't or you bobble a ball or stuff starts happening. We're like, why'd you turn that shot down? Well, I don't think I was open. Well, I had a talk with him at some point. I said, listen, you're playing 15 minutes a game right now. How are you shooting? He said, I'm shooting terribly. I, I shoot this poorly if I tried. I said, so what does that tell you about what we think about you as a coach? If you're shooting terribly in your own words, you're shooting about 10% on threes and you're still playing 15 to 18 minutes a game. What does that mean? And he said, well, you think I'm going to make one eventually? I said, well, yes, partly yes, but partly I don't care whether you make shots. You're doing enough things great on the court that just shoot your shot when you're open. You'll know I don't want you to shoot when you stop playing. When I don't play anymore, that's when you'll know I don't want you to shoot. But if you're on the court, and so this is a long-winded way of Chris is saying, I think unbridled confidence is first and foremost. If I believe a guy is a great shooter, then the only thing I'm going to tell him is whenever you are open, shoot it every single time. And that sounds simple, but at the end of the day, 
you know, there's a nice two by two matrix that a lot of coaches are familiar with that starts with, you know, we, we start at unconscious incompetence, right? We don't know how bad we are at something. And then we become consciously incompetent where we suddenly have that aha moment, like, whoa, I suck at that. Whether it's, you know, riding a bike as a young kid or playing the piano or shooting the basketball. And then we move to conscious competence where we're good at something, but it takes effortful thought and processing. And then finally, we move into unconscious competence where, you know, getting in the flow state, we don't have to think. And when you talk to great shooters, what are you thinking about when you make 15 in a row? They say nothing. And so I think our job then as coaches is to get them thinking about nothing, make or miss, short memories. When you're open, you shoot it every time and you expect it's going to go in and you go back to the self-fulfilling prophecy. We're jumping around with a lot of different psychological terms, but they're also intertwined and interconnected because that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think every shot's going to go in and you forget that you missed four in a row, your chances of making your fifth one are pretty darn good if you're a great shooter. Love it. And and again, it speaks to the, the kind of the normalizing the situation, almost creating, uh, you know, a, a joke about it in a way, right? Like they talk about smiling through adversity or different things like that. It's like, hey, this is normal. This is natural. This is going to happen. And uh, not kind of this this notion of, oh, I got to work harder, right? And if, you, if you've done any martial arts or Eastern philosophy, they'll just say, actually do less. Do right? less. Do less. Yes. Yeah. Probably one last quick story. We, one of the greatest stories we've had here at St. Thomas, a kid who got cut from his high school team three straight years. He sung in the choir for two years at St. Thomas. And kids at our program kept telling me, you got to see this kid. Like, this is the best shooter I've ever seen. And so you're thinking, how could he get cut from his high school team? And I actually write about his parents in the book as well, because he was, he was cut from a high school team and they didn't badmouth the coach. They said, well, you better keep working hard. And, you know, so they supported him and you love basketball, keep working hard. He never made his varsity team at the biggest high school in the state, mind you. And he comes here. So we work him out one day, first day of tryouts, his junior year, he's 70 of 71 on three point shots, 70 of 71, nothing I've ever seen. Neil Anderson is the name. And so here Neil is, but he's never played organized basketball since ninth grade. And so he finally gets his chance in a game. And he can't make a shot. And this happens a few straight games. And I remember I was an assistant coach at the time and our head coach, we were debating at halftime and we were not very good that year on offense. And we were debating at halftime. Can we play him? And I knew in my mind as a first year offensive coordinator, we're not going to score 20 points in the half. If we don't play him, we have to keep trying him. But I also, I go back to, I believed, I knew I had seen him shoot enough times in practice where once he made a couple, he was going to be fine. Well, Thank God he made five threes that second half of that game. And he went on to set the single season three point shooting record that season. But this is a kid who hadn't played organized basketball for five years. And so his confidence until he had several games of success, he was probably going to doubt whether or not I can really do this. And again, once he crossed that barrier and most NBA players will talk about that going from college to the NBA, it feels different, but it's the old Hoosiers thing, right? The hoops 10 feet high. Once you make a few, you forget about it and you stop thinking. And that's the key. I love it. I love it. I mean, so, so much of this again applies to so many situations, not just basketball, but the life as well. And uh, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us, John. I mean, uh, definitely I have a passion for this and I can tell you do as well. And I know you'll get tons of coaches reaching out for more information, but uh, we'll make sure we get another podcast on this going with you and I as well. So we can talk some more. Yeah. One of the things I'll tell you, Chris, during COVID, I, I've been out riding my bike a lot and you know this and my, my greatest therapy, it's that hour and 45 minute bike ride. And then I put, put on some podcasts and your yours is my favorite. Um, and I, so I just, I appreciate all you do. You know, we, I think one of the things I, I love about this, we didn't, I don't know that we really talked much about basketball yet. Everything talked about was basketball and we're, we're going through a transition from division three to division one at St. Thomas that uh, hasn't been done before. And so we're entering sort of these uncharted territories. And so many of the topics that we're talking about, we're going into a new situation that's incredibly exciting. And it's how do you take each day? And um, just like a shooter does a shot, how do you make the most out of each day um, through the ups and the downs and the, the exciting challenges ahead? So I'm very grateful to be on here. Huge fan of your show. 
Well, thank you so much. I'm grateful for that and grateful for all the coaches that have shared and supported this podcast. And yeah, no, that's so funny because that was actually one of my main topics when I reached out to you was going to be talking about that transition, but uh, we'll get you back on after you've gone through that transition, maybe and talk about it and uh, such a unique thing, but uh, I know you'll be successful in, in all of that. So thanks again, coach. Thank you, Chris. Have a great day. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the Basketball Podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things Basketball Immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.